All right, welcome everybody to another Commander's Film Room on All 22 Tuesday. Uh, George Carmi couldn't make it today, and of course, Nick Ackridge is off on sabbatical. Uh, so it's just me and Mark holding the fort down today. We are going to continue to look at some of the things that Hal has done to uh, improve, I think, as the, as the year goes on, maybe at least in recognition. We'll look at some some defenses that didn't go quite right. And then, Mark, all through the week, I think we've heard people often ask, what's the deal with Terry? So we're going to look at a little bit of that as well and see if we can't get into what's really happening here. But uh, I know you've got a package together. I'm excited for what you brought. Let's uh, let's get it going. Yeah, so I thought I'd start us off with, um, There's a I wrote about it um, on, on Monday on my Substack this Um how the Dolphins schemed up pretty well um, against Washington's offense and, and, and how they kind of shut it down a little bit. And um, they used this pressure package uh, where they consistently were able to generate uh, an overload to one side of the offensive line. Um, and that forced Sam Howell to check the ball down really quickly. And, and they had defenders running up and, and making tackles really quickly. And, and that kind of shut down what Washington was doing offensively. So, um, I thought I'd start off first by showing exactly what that scheme or that package looks like. Um, so from that um, Dolphins game here, we've got um, basically Washington's in a, a two by two sets. Curtis Samuel just motioned across the formation, um, and essentially what the what the Dolphins are doing is they're trying to over, uh, overload one side of the line. They're, they've got their four down linemen here: the edge rusher, two defensive tackles, and this edge rusher. Um, and what they do is bring this linebacker on a, on a blitz up the middle as well. Um, and you'll see this scheme as we go through this package. Sometimes this defensive end on the other side joins the rush and it's a five-man rush. Sometimes he um, sinks out into coverage to replace the linebacker. Um, it, it's largely the same scheme either way. Um, it just changes from a four-man rush to a five-man rush, but it's still generating the same issue for Washington. Um, so what we see here from Washington is in an ideal situation, you are able to identify that this linebacker, you can see him here just with the snap, he's kind of leaning forward, ready to, to go and, and kind of tipping that he wants to rush. Um, ideally, your quarterback or your center sees that and, and they make an adjustment call and they slide the protection this way. And then you get all three uh, for the center, the left guard and the left tackle, all fanning out this way to pick up those three. And you have three for three and you're fine. Um, what actually happens for Washington is they don't adjust the protection and so um the center actually slides the other way um and that leaves chris paul the left guard to pick up the defensive tackle and then charles leno is left in a two-on-one situation and leno basically the tackles are always taught in that situation they have to squeeze the inside gap take the easiest path to the quarterback and then that makes how responsible for this guy on the edge and obviously the way to beat that is quickly throwing to i think it's Curtis samuel in the flat so we'll run this through quickly here and we'll see that linebacker comes up. You see Leno squeezes inside, picks him up, and that leaves the edge rusher coming free. Hal identifies that, and it, this is a, it's a good post-snap process. When you identify that rusher, you know Hal knows he's got to he's got to get the ball out. He's got to be responsible for this guy. So he's already setting up to throw over the top of him to, to Samuel in the flat. The issue is, is that the Dolphins are very much aware that this is what how is going to do and you can see this safety is already driving down on, on Curtis Samuel um, and by the time Samuel makes that catch he's already being tackled and it's a, what, a one yard gain maybe a two yard gain at most um, so and and by the time he's actually fully tackled it's basically there so yeah this is the the end zone Mark, angle this, of it. Mark this is a really good Dolphin secondary by the way yes it is and, and they, they tackle extremely well um, so when, when they are rallying down to the football they aren't missing tackles and, and so the, the, these very short hot routes to receivers or running backs in the flat sometimes for Washington has, has yielded a few nice solid gains from missed tackles but the Dolphins aren't doing that um, but yeah this is the end zone angle where you see that linebacker is going to rush this defensive tackle is going to take Paul inside and it's going to leave Leno where he has to either pick between these two rushers and he, t he does the correct thing of taking the inside guy and, and leaving the outside guy for Hal. So the post snap process is good, but again, you're getting a free rusher on Hal and Hal's having to throw over it and they're not getting anything from that play. 
So this has been something that has been an issue for Washington basically the entire season. Um, they, they fail to identify it and they're consistently left overloaded. Um, so this is all the way back in, what was it, week three or week four with the Eagles? Yeah. Um, you see it's basically the exact same look. Um, you've got the edge rusher coming off the edge. You've got the defensive tackle. These guys change which gap they're going in. So the defensive tackle is going in the B gap and the linebacker is going in the A gap. But essentially it's the same thing is that the center is sliding away from them. And so it's three rushes against the left tackle and left guard. Um, and on this occasion, uh, these two fan out and you have the Paul takes the defensive tackle. Um, and because that linebacker goes inside, uh, Leno isn't responsible for him. So Leno takes the edge rusher and that leaves the linebacker free up the middle. So this is one of the first times we, we saw it. And obviously that linebacker gets a free run right up the middle. Maybe you think Antonio Gibson should possibly be thinking about trying to protect this, but he clearly doesn't really make any effort to make that block. And he can, he's obviously looking at him and can see him rushing there. So if, if he was meant to protect, he's doing a, a really bad oh, job. So, job yeah. Which yeah, would make I, you I, assume that that was not his responsibility, right? He's got to get the yeah. piece, the quick outlet. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I, I, I'm assuming I'm going to give him enough credit to say he would have seen this and thought, that, well, this isn't my responsibility. So he's getting out into his route. Um, and, and maybe it was a blown protection. We don't know. Um, but yeah, essentially what that does is you can see Gates are sliding to the right side. You've got both of these guys occupied already. So that linebacker again comes free. Um, and Sam Howell this time hasn't seen it, hasn't identified it, and he gets sacked. Um, and so that was kind of the story of, of what this concept was early in the season. It was leading to sacks, and then uh, this was the Bills game. Again, it was week three or week four. I can't remember which quickly game. For, came first. Quickly for you, run it, Mark. I thought it was yeah. funny because you said, uh, you know, and their gates is, and I thought, oop. And I was getting ready to correct you for a second. I said, no, that really is kind of the story of the season, right? Is we're back at looking at some of these things and how much yep. has changed since then. Yes. Yeah. Like, it, it sounded funny, but it really is kind of the story of the season so far. For sure. Um, so, yeah, this was the Bills game, which I can't remember which one was first, the Bills or the, the Eagles game. But um, this is, again, the same idea. Um, as I mentioned, uh, sometimes these teams have this defensive end on the other side drop out into coverage and sometimes he joins the rush on this occasion the bills have him drop out into coverage but you're still getting the same idea here where um the line is not sliding towards this blitz the, the center is going the other way um and what that leaves again is three defenders against two blockers um and so how um again does this the correct thing post snap here um so we'll see um he, he turns his head, he can see this guy's coming free. Leno slides inside again, picks up the, the inside rusher and leaves the edge guy to Howell. Um, but Howell is maybe a little bit late to realize that I've got to get this ball out. But once he sees him, he's like, okay, I've got to throw hot. The issue is, again, this safety driving down real quick on it. Um, and the, the ball, because he, he isn't quite on time getting that ball out, the safety is able to undercut it. And then he gets the interception. Um, so that was what causing them issues early in the season. Again, you can see that overload and, and the, it leads to the interception that, we've that's seen. The that. tight, that's the tight end. We, could you run it back, Mark? Is that the tight end it, running over the middle of the field? Um, is he open? Is he open only because the, the play was already over? Uh, it's right there in the middle oh, of yeah. the field. Tight end in the middle of the field. Yeah, possibly. Um, but when, when Hal recognizes that he's met he's responsible for this edge guy it's it's instantly yeah, okay. think i've got to throw hot so right. it's the rest of this doesn't matter it's i've got to find my hot route which is this running back in the flat um and he doesn't do it quick enough um so the good thing from a washington perspective is we've seen the progress from how with this this scheme um as the season's progressed because obviously in the, that eagles game it was a sack in this one it was an interception um the bears game the next week they, they run a very similar thing where the, the linebacker joins the rush and he, he comes up the middle completely free. This time, again, they still don't get it picked up, but this time Hal recognizes it quicker and notices he's got to get this ball to the to the running back quicker. Um, so you can see he instantly sees, okay, that guy's coming free and I know my protection's not accounting for him. So I've got to 
quickly run away buy myself some time and then get this ball out to the flat which he does so that's that was the first sign of progression that hey i'm starting to to understand that when this, this is happening i've got to get that ball out quickly and and that's that's not a bad thing um that that's that's a young quarterback showing some progression um now we fast forward to just a few weeks ago against against the seahawks the seahawks ran this a couple of times um and on both times we again see that progress from how where he's recognizing it happening once the ball was snapped and again he's doing a really good job of identifying that the rush was coming knowing that he's hot and he's got to get that ball out quickly so again it's the same scheme um this time as i say that the seahawks have that defensive end drop out so it's only a four-man rush but it's all from that one side um that linebacker joins the rush um and you can see they're going to be overloaded because you got Leno picking up the edge rusher. You got Paul picking up the defensive tackle. Leno at the last second tries to get inside to to pick up that linebacker, which leaves the edge rusher free. Um, but Hal manages to read it quick enough. And actually, he does such a good job of reading, understanding this quick enough that he gets the ball out to Gibson early enough for Jamal Adams to not be able to make the play immediately. And that gives Gibson a chance to make him miss and, and pick up some positive yards. Um, but again, yeah, this, you see this, the, the problem here is that they're constantly being overloaded and especially on this left side, they're not identifying it pre-snap and Hal is doing a good job post-snap of now seeing, okay, I understand I'm hot. Like he's already getting ready to throw this before this guy's even reached the line of scrimmage. So that is progress. Um, and he's able to get that out quickly enough for, you know, Jamal Adams misses that tackle. Um, and again, later in the game, it's the exact same situation. Um, and again, he does a good job getting that ball out quickly. And Antonio Gibson's able to make a make a play and pick up some positive yards. Um, so there is progress. Um, but the issue is, is that the Dolphins identified that this was a issue and they weren't getting the, they were going to just constantly run it. They ran this this look five, maybe six times in this game. And every well, single time it, it, it was an issue for Washington. Um, and if, if so. we're if we're watching it on a Tuesday, you know, it's just a highlight package and trying to sort through it, you know the league has seen it. I mean, that's that's what they do, right? I mean, that's why yeah. if you're brand new to the scene, there's no tape on you, it's always an advantage. How much of this now is on the you know, we've been doing this all year, right? How much is on the quarterback? How much is on the offensive line? And then what we're seeing more and more now, which I think is interesting, is how much is on Eric Bieniemy, the play caller. You know, count. It's a chess match, right? So if you know that they know that you know, but how, is Bieniemy doing the things to put defenses in a bad position, allowing them to assume that this is what you're going to do? Yeah, well, it's, it's a tough one to blame the enemy too much because the protections he calls aren't... It, it's not like the defense is rushing six and the offensive line only... The offense only has five guys in to block it. The offense has enough guys in to block on every play. It's yeah. just a case of they're not being targeted in the right direction. And, then, and the enemy can't guarantee that he can target the protection the right way when he calls the play because he doesn't know how the defense is going to line up. Um, so that is on the quarterback and the center. Um, typically, it's more so on the quarterback, but obviously Sam Howe's a young quarterback, so it's going to take some time. And, and that's that's part of the point of showing this package is that we've seen from week one, uh, well, sort of the first five or so weeks of the season, he was starting to understand, okay, when I get this look post-snap, I know I've got to be hot. I've got to throw that ball immediately, and, and I'm responsible for that free rusher. And, and that's good progress. Um, and we saw against the, the Seahawks a few weeks ago with those couple of clips, he was doing that really quickly, processing that really well and getting the ball out early. The issue is that the Dolphins then noticed that every time they use this stunt, Howell's going to immediately throw that ball to the flat. Um, and so they could then charge up on it and take advantage and make sure that that tackle doesn't get broken and they only gain a few yards and, and they're caught behind the chains. How um, good so, is how good is Vic Vangio, who's been doing it forever? I mean, yeah, he's he's probably about as good a defensive coordinator in the league as there is right now. So um, you have to give him some credit. And um, you know, the, the 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 thing that this game proved is that 
while Sam Howell has shown some signs of progress, there is another step for him to take forward. And, and this is the next step is identifying this stuff pre-snap so that he can adjust the protection, get that line sliding into that overload so that it, they're no longer overloaded. And then he doesn't have to throw hot. He can throw this stick route maybe or work to this other side of the field. He, he knows he has the numbers to pick up the, the rush. And so this is that first one again. Um, and again, the, the point I'm trying to highlight is you can get little tells from the defense sometimes. This one here, that linebacker is leaning forward. You can kind of tell from his posture. You can see how his head's way over his feet rather than this guy is more balanced. This guy is leaning forward, ready to go. Um, and you can see at the snap of the ball, he's he's joining that rush and it's pretty obvious. Um, and that that's something that you'd ideally like your quarterback to see and adjust the protection and pick it up. Um, so I'm just going to let this run through because... There's, I think, I think I've got four or five examples of this. The the Dolphins running this same look, and and every time they they have success with it, and and they change it up. Sometimes, sometimes it, it, it was always a linebacker. Sometimes teams have done it with a slot defender and and had the same result. Um, this is a linebacker over a tight end in the slot, but he joins the rush, and they they will change up exactly who's rushing which gap. But the result is always you get these three guys over the two guys here and they're overloaded and there's no way they can pick up three defenders. Um, and so on this occasion, uh, um, the guy comes free up the middle and, and Hal has to scramble. And, um, you know, Chris Paul doesn't do a great job here. He just gets beat by his guy, um, which, I mean, that's another issue that, you know, he's, he, he's he, not he, he, exactly. Um, and e even if you have the numbers to pick up guys, that doesn't mean that those those numbers will equate, equate to good protection. Um, but at least in theory, you're able to pick up all, all three of those rushers. But obviously, Chris Paul gets beat here, and, and Hal actually does a nice job to scramble away from this and, and pick up a positive way by scrambling. But um, it, it was interesting when you said about leaning forward there in the, in the intricacies. And we, we've seen that in previous episodes where we're looking at the feet and the way they point. I thought it was interesting to hear Van Winkle talk about the film study they had done and they had noticed a tell with Wiley where whether it was going to be a run or whether it was going to actually be a screen and they were ready for that thing uh, I, found, I found that very interesting yeah and that's the thing that players study throughout the week um, yep. they obviously are getting their game plan from their coaches but they're doing their own study on their specific opponent that they're going to play against so um that this is something that Howell should be studying and, and kind of looking at the defense and particular defenders and especially with how this is happening so frequently he should be looking at linebackers and, and slot defenders and looking for what their tells are is a guy as i said leaning forward is there a safety behind him that kind of gives an indication that this slot guy might be joining the rush which on this occasion you can kind of see this this safety is yeah. is over the top so that that's an end indicator it could of course be that that safety is just playing a quarter here or a deep half and it's just lining up to to bluff that but it is an indicator that you can kind of get that you might need to think okay i need to slide the line that way um and the other part of it is like if the line's sliding this way there, there's nobody over here that's going to be blitzing so why not have the line slide that way anyway right um so again same situation and in fact this is one that we'll come back to with the mclaurin package of stuff later um because they're doing this they're they're motioning the running back out here to have four receivers on this side of the field to isolate mclaurin um so i think this was a play that they designed to go to mclaurin to have him isolated um but because the dolphins use this scheme this pressure package again uh, they get the left side of the line overloaded. Howell again recognizes it and again knows, right, I've got to get that ball out to the flat quickly, which means he doesn't see McLaurin getting a step on this guy over here because he's being trained that, you know, when I get this overload look, I've got to get that ball out quickly to the flat, which is correct. Um, but if he slides the line and gets it picked up, then maybe he gets to see that McLaurin here, you know, gets a step on his defender rather than having to throw this out to the flat. And this one isn't the worst play in the world. Like Gibson picks up a few yards, but it's just another example of, you know, that scheme is taking away from them being able to do much more. Um, and this one, I think this is the final one I've got on this package. I, I might have one more, but the Dolphins ran it, as I say, they ran it five or six times. Um, and this again, exact same thing, just on the other side of the line this time. Um, and this time Van Ginkle is the, is the free rusher off the edge and, 
and he gets his hands up and, and blocks Hal's pass. So, you know, it, it's a scheme that is consistently giving them issues um, and is one that Washington really needs to do something about. And it, it's something that how it, it's hard for Eric Bieniemy to really do much more than he is. He's providing the protections, like he's given them the numbers um, to pick up the guys. It, it's on Hal or Larson to identify, hey, we've got that pressure package that has been giving us troubles all year. We've got that coming. Um, so we need to slide this line this way and, and get that picked up. Um, so that's that's a little something that we can see. Look, Hal has taken steps forward. He's no longer taking the sacks or the interceptions that he was earlier in the season with that package. But he is now being found out as I'm throwing it to the flat instantly every single time that I get that look. Um, and I'm missing other things, like as I just mentioned with that McLaurin thing, that he, he's potentially missing other shots because he's having to get the ball out to his hot round. Um, so the next step in Hal's progression um, is identifying those things pre-snap so that he's not having to throw hot post-snap. Um, so that that was the little package of plays I had um, for, for that. And I, I just thought it was an interesting way to show the progression of Sam yeah. Hal. How he's and of course, moved, the, com- how he's moved. the comments I'm yeah. sure will reference the O line and how porous they are, and that if only Hal had a better line, he may be able to disguise some of these. But I think it is. I think to your point, Mark, and we've seen it all year. It, it's more about the the processing. The the game yeah. is very fast at this level. He wasn't asked to do a lot of this stuff in North Carolina, and so to see him kind of make some of these you know, progressions along the season, I think is hope for it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I, like oh. it, it, it was a big step forward. Like you, you, it, the sacks and interceptions early in the season were an issue. And obviously the sacks more so than the interceptions, but, but both were an issue. And when you're able to cut down on plays that are giving you sacks and interceptions and turning them into even just a four or five yard gain with a hot throw to the flat, that's a huge flip from a sack or an interception, right? It keeps the drive alive and, and lets them move on to the next play without a huge negative. Um, so that is a sign of progression, but it also shows that there is another step forward for how to take. He, he's not the finished product and nobody expects him to be, obviously, at this point. But um, th- there's another step for him to take. And, and um, yeah, the, the offensive line hasn't been great for him. Like we saw with that that play where Chris Paul got beat. Like you can't, you can't account for an offensive lineman getting beat. But you have to still be able to know your protection scheme and understand where the blitz is coming from and ensure that you at least have the right number of players going towards wherever a blitz might be coming from. Um, so that that part isn't on the offensive line. Like the the being overloaded part wasn't on the offensive line. That was on Howell or possibly right. Larson, whoever was responsible for identifying the blitzes and adjusting protections. Um, so that that's the next step for how is, is being able to start identifying those things. And and he's shown some ability to do that. I, I think we saw it in the Patriots game. I've shown that example a couple of times where they had that zero blitz and he threw over it to Jahan Dotson for the touchdown. Um, so he has shown some examples of identifying that stuff, but um, it obviously it's not a finished article yet. And um, there, there's still steps for him to take. So um yeah, um, and the the next stuff I've got, um, I, if we want to move on, um, was the mm-hmm. looking at the defense with um, the Tyree Kill touchdown on the, the fourth play of the game. Um, and I, I thought we'd very quickly cover the defense with, with just one play. We we obviously saw Ron Rivera uh, take charge of the defense with, with Jack Del Rio being fired. And um, Rivera, we all kind of assumed, would play a lot more zone coverage and, and get away from the man coverage stuff that had been getting them beat. And by and large in the game, he did. But, um, you know, fourth play of the game, uh, he, for some reason, called man coverage. And I, I don't really understand why. And, and so we'll, we'll, we'll break down the, the play um, as painful as it is to watch. Um, starting off, running backs in the backfield, we got a three by one set. Um, receivers in a tight split and the running back motions outside of him. Jamin Davis follows him in motion, which is a pretty strong indicator for, for the Dolphins that, Washington's in man coverage. Um, so then the Dolphins get lined up. They're uh, they're ready to snap the ball, and, and these are the, the route combinations they have. Um, 
mainly they're looking to hit Tyree Kill on this slot fade, uh, but they've also got the running back running a, a fade himself um, against Jamin Davis. So they've got two matchups that they'll like. The running back on, on Davis is, is a matchup that they'll like. Um, and then they've got rookie safety, Quan Martin, um, or rookie defensive back. He, he plays nickel um, on, on Tyree Kill, which is just a bad matchup for Washington to, to or enable. Yeah. Um, so to put to put a young guy that they don't even really want on the field, like you know, the start of the season they they didn't want yeah. him on the field. He's only on the field because he's because of injuries. Um, to put him not only on the field but in a situation where he's got to cover probably the best, certainly the fastest receiver in football one on one on a slot fade is 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 bad. Um, and and Tua explained after the game he was basically reading the deep safety here who is. Cam Curl, he rotates back to the deep middle, but basically um, he was going to go off of Curl. If Curl stayed over on this side, which he does, he was going to go to Tyree Kill. But if, if Curl had um, had worked across to try to get over the top of the hill, he was going to go to the running back on Davis. Um, and as we'll run this through, you'll see he could have gone either way because um, Tyree Kill wins, but the running back also wins. Um, you can see Davis goes to jam him, and then the back beats him pretty instantly. And, you know, he's he's going to be gone there. Um, but Quan Martin also gets beat. Um, Tyreek Hill puts a nice move on him. It, it's a tough spot. He could do a lot better. He probably wants to play it inside out rather than allowing Hill to get back inside of him. Um, but again, it's a very tough situation to put a young player like that in and Tyreek Hill just runs away from him. Um, and then two or throws a nice ball and, and Hill's off to the races and, and you're not catching that guy. I don't, I don't know if there's anyone in the league that does. Um, so, and then up front, I was actually a little surprised that Carl even got close. Yeah, he, Carl did well to cover as much ground as he did and, and get close because uh, Tyreek's a fast guy. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, up front, they, did, they didn't really get much pressure either. Um, no. I do wonder whether the, they intended to possibly have Cody Barton. They probably wanted Cody Barton in this hole to cover for shallow crosses, but I do wonder if he was possibly meant to blitz because... They have everyone stunting to this right side of the line and they end up having no one on this edge to contain. Um, and you'll see that here. You've got John Allen coming inside. You've got Ed Rusher. I think it's Casey Tuhill comes inside. Um, they don't get any real pressure, um, but then they've got nothing on this edge to contain. So um, even if Washington had somehow managed to cover things, Tua has a, basically an easy lane to escape and then try to work one-on-one -on -one against Barton. Um, but as it was, Martin got beaten. You know, it was off to the races. Um, so pretty poor. You think maybe there's going to be some change, but there wasn't. Uh, well, to be fair, there was some change. They did switch up and play a lot more zone throughout most of the game. But for them on the fourth play of the game to I, allow... I, I think Ben Standing said it was like 5% of the plays they were in man, but both times or all three times, whatever it was, burnt toast. Yeah, so um, incredibly disappointing. Um, but we'll uh, we'll get away from defense because I think everyone's done talking about the defense this year. Do you, do you, can, is Benjamin St. Juice a starting level outside corner? Can you be uh, confident in him as the starter going into next season opposite Emmanuel Forbes? I, I think they probably have enough needs around the board that if, if they don't get to signing or drafting a corner that is capable of starting then they go that route route but I, I i don't feel great about him starting um but perhaps in a different system in a different scheme but the weird thing about st juice is he's taking a weird development path they, they drafted him as this long press yes. corner um and then they've kind of tried to switch into being a zone corner um but using his length to break up stuff and that took him a while, but when he's played off coverage and zone coverage this year, um, he still has issues sometimes where there's multiple reads for him and, and he, he misses some stuff. But um, when there's like quick throws out to the flat, he's very good at driving down on them and, and breaking them up or, or at least contesting them. Um, so perhaps there is a path for him to being developed into that type of corner um, where you, if you if you're going to pair him with Forbes and, and have both of them play off and, and zone or match coverages, the kind of stuff they did last year successfully, then then maybe that is something that St. Just will start to develop some consistency with. But um, at this point, 
he's being asked to do so many different things from switching outside to inside playing man playing zone um like that he's being asked to do a lot of different things um so it, it's hard to really get a fair evaluation on I, I think his head's spinning a little bit um so it, it's hard to get a fair evaluation on him um so if we want to move into the Terry McLaurin yeah. stuff um yes we've got a lot of this the last week or two about you know what what's going on with Terry is the toe bad he's no separation I mean no catch in the last game. I don't. I don't. I'm not sure he's had a game in his NFL career without a catch. He's had one. Uh, I looked it one. up. Uh, he had one against Dallas Cowboys almost a, a year to the day. Um, it was December in 2021, uh, two years ago. Um, and he, yeah, he had zero catches on three targets. Exactly the same as, as what he just had on on Sunday. Um, and but every other game in his career he's had a had a catch um so it, it was an odd one um and i had I, I wrote about this last week because there was kind of an outcry of mclaurin only got four catches and he, he had 11 targets and is he not getting open how is he being used and he's not being fed the ball and that kind of thing um and then obviously this week comes up and and he doesn't get anything um so I thought I would address first the overall usage of McLaurin and the philosophy of this offense. Um, and the way Eric bien likes to run his system is um, because Washington has so many weapons, they have obviously Terry McLaurin, John Dotson, Curtis Samuel we've seen the last few weeks has shown up real nice. Um, Logan Thomas at tight end. The running backs, both Brian Robinson and Antonio Gibson have shown up nicely. Um, Crowder, Jam Jameson Crowder, uh, Pringle, um Jeremy brown have all made some nice plays I, I think washington have something like 10 receivers with over 100 yards receiving this year um so they like to spread the ball around and and you make use of all those weapons and they they move those guys around and and let the coverage kind of pick their poison and dictate who the ball goes to um and and this this first little clip package that i've got kind of demonstrates that this is just a basic stick concept uh, you've got McLaurin split uh, aligned tight to the formation. He's running the stick route, and you've got Logan Thomas at the tight end spot. He's running out to the flat. Um, and so, if we run this through, um, you'll see the stick combination. Um, the read is either you're looking for that stick route, or you're working to the flat, and you're kind of working off the flat defender. Um, you can see the flat defender here goes out to the flat to match Logan Thomas, which means McLaurin is left open, and that's where the ball goes to Terry McLaurin. Um, now we look, that was back in the Falcons game, uh, against the Giants game a few weeks ago. This is the exact same concept run from a, a slightly different look. Um, you got this time Logan Thomas is the point guy and you got McLaurin stacked behind him and they're, they're split away from the formation a little bit more, but it's still the same idea. You've got McLaurin on, on the stick round, you've got Thomas working out to the flat. Um, and as we run this through, you'll see the coverage kind of dictates, um, you know, this guy potentially is the flat defender. You've also got this guy out here that could be the flat defender, but he can't just fly up to the flat in case McLaurin is, is running a, a deep corner route. Um, so you've got Logan Thomas running free into the flat um, and you've got a defender here that's really close to McLaurin. Um, so obviously you can't just throw that ball to McLaurin. So it's the same concept that we saw in the previous play that went straight to McLaurin, but the coverage dictated that this time that ball goes out to the flat. Um, so that's kind of how this offense works, where the you have two good weapons there in, in McLaurin and then Thomas, and they run the same route combination um, on, on two separate plays, but the coverage dictated on the first one that it went to McLaurin and on the second one it went to Logan Thomas. Um, and the other part of this kind of system is that they'll move their weapons around and sometimes, you know, what we'll see here is this this is a combination called they, they probably i think the andy reed tree calls this missile um where you have a receiver running a shallow cross and that's designed to take coverage away and then you've got a slot receiver running basically a slant um and that's the primary option once the coverage is taken inside with a shallow cross and then you've got a little backup follow route um, or under route um that you can throw if if the coverage doesn't necessarily bite on this one and, and takes away the slot slant but um so we'll just run this through and you can see McLaurin's the guy in the in the slot here and he's the primary option. Um, this safety bites up and, and attaches to this route, which opens up that space for McLaurin um, and how hits McLaurin over the middle and, and that's a nice catch. Um, 
Then a few weeks later against the Cowboys, we see the exact same concept, but they just move the guys around. Um, and that's one way to disguise being able to run the same kind of handful of, of concepts. They, they move the guys around so that you're not keying on, okay, McCormick's in the slot last time here, so we know this is the concept. This time he's further inside. And so this time McCormick's running that shallow cross, so he's not the primary option this play. He's there just to try to drag this coverage inside and open up this slant. Um, and actually what happens is um, he, he, he does a good job. He runs his route like enthusiastically. He, he drags some defenders across with him, but the coverage, um, the coverage from the Cowboys takes away that slant to um, Curtis Samuel, and you have Johan Dotson on that as that third option on the outside who gets the ball and, and how does a nice job progressing out towards him and, and making that play. So that's just an example of kind of how the offense works from a philosophical, uh, philosophical standpoint of the coverage is what dictates who gets the ball. It, it's not a case of this offense, we want to feed Terry McLaurin the ball 30 times a game and, and we want him to be our number one and, and we just want to go through him. It's We've got a bunch of playmakers. We're happy. We know all of them can make plays after the catch. So we're going to line them up in different spots. We're going to run the same handful of concepts to try to keep things a little bit easier for Hal. Um, so he's making the same read every time. We're going to move those guys around and sometimes it's going to be McLaurin that gets the ball. Sometimes it's going to be Samuel. Sometimes it'll be Dotson and so on and so forth. So that's the kind of overall philosophy of why there's been spells in this year where McLaurin's not had targets and John Dotson's had a load. And then there's been spells where Dotson's not had any. And then the last few weeks, Curtis Samuel's had quite a few um, because that's just how the offense works. Um, but they're, th but Mark, they're throwing it 50 times a game. It feels like out of 50, I mean, I understand not all of them, you know, are end up being targets, they're sacks and all the things, but it feels like, when you're throwing at that volume, you could find a way to make sure Terry got five or six targets a game. Sure. Um, and, and they do do some of that. And, and we'll come on to that in this this Dolphins game. I think they did do a bit of that. And they they, they didn't get him the ball for, for one reason or another. But from a philosophical standpoint, it's a case of we're not trying to force feed anyone the ball. We want Howell to be reading the coverage and correctly yeah. identifying the coverage and making the correct reads and whoever gets the ball gets the ball. And on one week, it's going to be McLaurin that gets it more. On the next week, it's going to be Dotson. The week after, it'll be Samuel and, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I think if I had a criticism of, of that philosophy, it would be, yeah, I don't mind that philosophy at all, but I, I would say maybe they, they shouldn't rotate in the, the bottom end of the receivers quite so often, like Byron Pringle and, and Jameson Crowder and, and Jeremy Brown, like, those guys get a lot of runtime and and they're good players. It's not that you don't want them to be on the field at all, but um, you would much That's rather you'd much rather their share of targets go to McLaurin and Dotson and, and Samuel because those guys are your number one receivers for a reason. Those, those are your top depth chart guys because you they're they're the better players. So that would be the criticism for me. Um, and also, interestingly enough, Mark. Uh, yep. There was one reception by a tight end on Sunday. It was Cole Turner. That was it. Yeah. Yeah, well, and that goes to show you, like, you know, that Logan Thomas has, has had a fair few receptions in the last few weeks. And, and a few weeks before that, John Bates had a nice spell where he was getting a lot of catches. Again, it just goes to that they're mixing guys in, they're rotating guys in and out, and, and they're... The philosophy is to move the ball around and spread the ball around to, to all their different weapons and, and let the coverage dictate who beats them, trusting that whoever is in on the play is capable of making a play. Um, which, again, I don't hate that philosophy, but maybe your the criticism would be keep your top guys in there more frequently rather than yes. using Diami Brown, Pringle, and, and your backups. Um, no, you're so right, because Pringle, you're exactly right, Mark. Pringle gets an odd amount of work. Yeah, and he's not a bad receiver, but you would much rather, you know, Pringles, however many catches he has, 20 or, or 25 catches or something so far this year, you'd much mm -hmm. rather those go into McLaurin. And, uh, right. Even if you spread them out amongst McLaurin and Dotson and Samuel, you know, um, you'd much rather that. But um, but yeah, if we if we move forward to this specific game against the Dolphins where, where he had no targets, I actually thought that was... The three targets isn't a fair representation because... There were plays drawn up for Terry McLaurin. Um, they weren't. It wasn't like 
we're just going to throw a goal, go route to you and therefore we're drawing this up to you. They, they were running plays that, like this one here is the first example and then you've got a dagger concept where um, this is a three-man dagger concept where you've got these two inside receivers are both running vertical routes. They're just designed to grab the attention of these two safeties and take them way off the screen and open up a big hole in the middle of the field for Terry McLaurin to run this dagger route for this deep dig. Um, and that's exactly what happens if, if we run this through. Um, this is a play, again, the dagger concept. Everyone knows dagger concept. Everyone runs it. Washington's run it for years. Um, Scott, It was one of Scott Turner's most frequently used plays um, when he was here the last three years. So um, McLaurin is the main target, the primary target of this um, on the outside here running this dig. And um, when when he starts to break, there is a window there. Now, this is a tight window. It takes a little bit of an anticipation, especially with this guy here being... A potential threat to kind of if you remember the Deami Brown touchdown catch from a few weeks ago that yep. kind of underneath guy can sink into that throwing lane so it takes some anticipation and trust to to, to deliver that ball as McLaurin's breaking um, and to hit that first window um, but it's there and and Howell has a weird play where um, we'll see it at the end zone angle he for some reason looks out to his right here I, I'm not sure whether he was checking this corner or whether he was checking the, the rusher, um, but that makes him late to come back. He's only just come back across to see this now um, with his helmet. So he's late to see this. Um, and then by the time he's seen it, he, he he's late. The, the ball should be kind of hitting McLaurin about now, and that would be open. Um, but he's late, and then that rush comes, uh, Van Kinkle comes and sacks him. So, um, And we'll see from this this angle where... Um, oh, well, I didn't have the end zone angle, but um, you can see as he drops back, um, he first he checks this safety. His eyes move to this safety, and then I think he checks this corner. Um, you can you'll watch his helmet. You'll see how he goes from this guy to this guy to this guy. Um, and you can see just here at the top of his drought, you can see those lines on the top of his helmet looking out this way. Um, and I think he's checking this corner, but he doesn't really have any huge reason to do so. Um, the only reason I could think of him doing that was if he was thinking about throwing this over route um, mm -hmm. and trying to hit this behind this corner. Yeah. But but the issue with that is that he's seen this safety is here, and this safety he should know is going to take going to match that route. So that is kind of dead at the moment he spots that safety. So he shouldn't really be even thinking this side. Um, so either he's made a misread by checking this corner or he's really worried about this edge rusher um, who just got chipped and forced really wide um, and then does a nice spin move to get inside of Wiley. Um, so that really he should already be looking outside here and thinking he, he might be able to hit McLaurin. Um, but he's late to get over there. And once he finally gets over there, he's already kind of too late to make that throw. Um, so that's one example of a play that is being run for McLaurin. Like the dagger concepts, he was the primary read on that play and he was open. There, there was a window to make that throw, but Hal made a mistake and, and you know, that happens. Um, but it means that he didn't even get the target because the ball wasn't thrown. Um, but that doesn't mean the play wasn't called for McLaurin. Um, and this was this is another one, exact same concept, dagger concept. This time they've only got one receiver inside rather than two, but the idea is the same. Your slot receiver is running this deep clearing route. He's there to try to grab this safety and, and drag him across the field and open up that dagger route for, for McLaurin. Um, and this time they're running off a little bit of play action. Um, but, you know, the, the idea is the same. Um, and you can see here, McLaurin runs a really nice route. Um, and that's something I'll talk a little bit more about a little bit later on. But um, I know people have been questioning whether McLaurin is has regressed or whether he's still a good route runner and stuff. This play kind of shows that he does. He's still a pretty good route runner. Um, he gets into the top of the numbers here, um, and then he just bends his route back towards the outside, just fractionally, but enough for this trailing defender to notice. Um, and when he gets to the top of his route here, he sells a jab step with his outside leg, and most importantly, a, a, just a slight head fake outside, and that gets the corner to stutter a little bit and in the end the corner actually falls down as once McLaurin then sharply breaks back inside um, but at, at the top of this drop you can see Howell's just about to hit the top of his drop that safety is already sliding across to try to match uh, I think it's John Dotson in the slot it might be Paris Samuel um, and so this is where he should be thinking of going with the ball um, now the problem here is that we have 
Andrew Wiley getting driven back with this. Wiley's not doing too bad of a job here. This this is quite a deep pocket, um, and in an ideal world, the rest of the protections up here um, where these guys are. Um, and so Hal is just able to take a hitch step and, and let Wiley run this guy past him. But unfortunately, Tyler Larson's also struggling and getting driven back, and that kind of squeezes the pocket a little bit. Um, but you can see McLaurin makes his guy fall over, and he's running open into space here. Um, so there is, again, it's, it's a play designed for McLaurin. He's open on the play. Um, but as sort of Hal hits that top of his drop, he's suddenly feeling that pressure, um, and he has to try to step up in the pocket he does well to avoid these first two, but then he gets this free guy. Um, again, does amazingly well to bounce off of that. Uh, but by that point, you know, the safety has adjusted and come back down to McLaurin. And, and then how uh, I'm going to give him credit and say he was trying to throw this away and, and trying to throw it way out over here, knowing that McLaurin was running that way. Um, I'm hoping that he didn't think, oh, I can still hit this to McLaurin. Um, but he throws it out there. But we've already seen a few times this year where he's not, when he's thrown the ball away, he's not got enough anywhere near enough on it. Um, and McLaurin ends up having to play the defender and, and jumping and competing at the catch point and, and breaking this up from being what, what should have been really an interception. Um, but but to, that's kind of a side point. To the, to the main point, again, it's a play that was being run for McLaurin. He did get open and something else impacted why he didn't get the ball. Um, and this is this is all within the sort of first half of the game, um, by the way. So this one is another one. This is the the play action shot. They they do a nice little play action fake here after a couple of runs. Uh, and McLaurin runs down the field. You'll see the safeties bite up on the play action. Um, and McLaurin again running open. Um, and he does a nice little fake here. And, and yeah. but unfortunately, you can see this side of the pocket a, a blitzer comes free up the middle. Um, and this. It's similar to the issue that we talked about earlier with um, them getting an overload on this side. Leno was watching this defensive end and should have been able to squeeze this, but he didn't. And that guy, come, that linebacker comes through and, and he hits Hal as Hal makes that throw. And frankly, it's kind of amazing that Hal was able to get enough on it for McLaurin to even have a chance of making that play because um, right. he was hit pretty heavily. Yeah, I did keep the end zone one in this. So it, it's it's not too dissimilar to the, the idea we've been seeing. Um uh, with the blitz package, it's slightly different because this edge rusher, he he fakes like he is blitzing to grab Leno's attention. So Leno is responsible for this guy first and foremost. Um, but then he drops off into coverage and Leno should slide back inside and pick up this rusher inside. But um, he doesn't do that. Um, and you can see him kind of waiting out here for that. He, that that's a mistake from Leno. And it's, it's a weird one because he's typically very good at understanding that mm -hmm. guy's not coming. I need to slide inside. Um, as we've kind of seen in the earlier package. Um, but yeah, that guy comes through and, and he hits Hal pretty, gets a pretty nice shot off on Hal there. And, and it's kind of amazing that that even got that far um, and then was nearly catchable. But again, it's such another shot designed for McLaurin um, that was there and, and didn't connect because the protection didn't hold up. Um, so then we start talking about, you know, stuff that you can run specifically for Terry McLaurin. Um, and this is one of the things that Washington likes to do. Uh, this is something I wrote about last week. When they want to get McLaurin the ball, they call this, what, this is just called a, a shallow cross concept. Sometimes it's the tight end, they call it Y shallow cross. In this case, it's McLaurin. So the X shallow cross. And what you have is just McLaurin running a shallow cross and you have a receiver from the other side. Normally it's Logan Thomas. Um, this time it's Curtis Samuel. And that's an important thing to note, um, but we'll get to that. Um, and he's just running a, a, a sit route. But the idea here is that he's running more kind of trying to impact any cover, any defender trailing McLaurin. He's kind of trying to pick them and then kind of peel off and act like he's sitting in the middle of the field. But the idea is to kind of pick any defender trailing McLaurin and, and, and get McLaurin a free run out here. Um, now, the reason I, I noted that it was Samuel rather than Thomas, Thomas is very good at coming across obviously he's a big body and, and if a trailing defender runs into him he's going to get knocked over and, and Thomas is going to stand there um, but as we run this through what we'll see is Samuel doesn't time this up quite rightly you can see McLaurin's coming across here and, and, and the Dolphins have this whole player um, that his job is to deal with shallow crossing routes um, and so he's the guy that's going to be responsible for trying to cut off Terry McLaurin's route um, but Samuel should be trying to get real close to him and, and impact him from cutting off McLaurin's route. Instead, he gets vertical um, 
to get into his sit too early. And all that does is allow this player to get his eyes across the field and see McLaurin and drive down on the route. And that basically kills any chance McLaurin has of taking of, of getting the ball on this play. Um, and again, Sam Howell is, is looking for McLaurin. That's the primary option. This play is run basically to try to get the ball to McLaurin. Um, and they do get man coverage. So that's what they want. They just need to take care of this player. And Samuel doesn't do that. Um, and then unfortunately, with, with that first read not there, Howell then gets sacked. Um, so, and then again, we talked about this play before, um, where they're trying to do stuff to get McLaurin the ball. Um, and they go with this overload of four receivers to one side. They, they motion Gibson out to the flat. Um, and they have this little concept here to beat zone coverage, but they're really, all they're trying to do is get McLaurin isolated on this corner and they, they kind of get that. Um, but then we saw, as we saw earlier, that they bring that blitz look that has been giving them issues the whole game and, and um, they get overloaded on this side. So this linebacker joins the rush and um, they get overloaded uh, and he gets a free rusher and how instantly sees that and again does the right thing um, from a process standpoint of if sometimes they will get a free rusher and, and you have those built-in processes for when that happens and, and he does the right thing of okay I see that free rusher I've got to get that ball out quickly to the flat and, and this is not a bad play at all from how but it just means that because they didn't get that protection uh, picked up properly, um, you don't get the chance of even looking at seeing how McLaurin does. And, and when we run this through, you can see McLaurin gets a step. And now this corner does bail off a little bit because he was peeking back and he could see that that ball was gone. Um, but McLaurin, you know, he, he I would back McLaurin to beat this corner in a foot race. So, um, and, and maybe that safety comes across a little bit more and, and stops that, but... Um, we'll never really know. Um, but again, it's a, it's a thing where they are trying to isolate him. They, they, this play is kind of drawn up to isolate McLaurin and, and make the most of his ability one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but because of the blitz look, they weren't able to get there. Um, so, yeah, that's... And, uh, yeah, okay, so the last play I had, um, this, this one is kind of irrelevant. Um, it was just more to point out as I kind of spoke to that, spoke about earlier, Terry McLaurin is still a very good route runner. Um, this one, this is third down, and this play is all about going to Jahan Dotson on a little concept on this side of the field. So this is not about trying to get the ball to McLaurin here at all. Um, but it's worth pointing out just how nice of a route this is. Um, he's against Jalen Ramsey here. We all know how good Jalen Ramsey is. Um, and Jalen Ramsey can see that he's kind of isolated out here against McLaurin. So Ramsey's assuming on third down, with the amount of slants that McLaurin typically runs, he's thinking McLaurin's going to try to run the slant inside. So off the snap, Ramsey's going to jump inside to take away that slant, and McLaurin's going to take that as an invitation to run a free outside release. Um, and then he runs a really nice route, and we'll get into the other details of the route, but you can see Ramsey opens up inside to try to take that slant option away, and McLaurin takes that as the invitation to release freely. Um, he gets a step, and then he does a real nice little stutter outside which gets Ramsey just to bite on a little fake outside. You can see there he's got the little head fake towards the sideline, the little jab step towards the sideline, and that gets Ramsey to adjust and uh, create separation as McLaurin breaks inside towards the middle. And you can see he, he gets that separation. Um, but unfortunately, at this point, you know, the, the play broken down and, and Howe's looking elsewhere. And actually, McLaurin separates again because he spots Howe scrambling this way and, and he breaks off his route and loops back outside, as you'll see here, and again gets away from him. So he wasn't the option, the real option on that play. That wasn't for him necessarily, but I just wanted to show that there is um, there is stuff. He, a, he's still a good receiver. He hasn't turned into a bad receiver overnight. He's still a very good route runner. Um, and B, in this specific game, there was quite a few plays that were drawn up with the idea of getting the ball to Terry McLaurin. Um, it wasn't necessarily force feeding him the ball, but it was with the intent of getting him the ball. Um, and for one reason or another, sometimes it was Hal making a bad read, but most of the time it was it was protection issues. Um, they didn't manage to get him the ball. But that, for me, it, as, as much as we all want to blame someone, it, it was just an unfortunate circumstance of the game that they weren't able to get him the ball. And, and maybe... Yes, you could argue, why did they not just revert to running more slants and stuff and, and force the ball his way? And maybe they should have done. They, they they didn't score enough points doing what they did anyway, so maybe that's what they should have done. But um, it's not like there were 
no efforts at all to get him the ball. Like there, there were quite clearly plays drawn up for him. So, um, I, like after the game, I had the same kind of thoughts as everyone else did. Like, what is the enemy doing? Why is McClure not getting any targets? But, but when you go back and watch the film, I, I think there there's enough examples there to suggest that he was still trying to get in the ball. There were plays in there for him. It just so happens that things didn't work out that way. Uh, yes, and it's interesting, and maybe that's what we'll spend a little bit of time on next Tuesday uh, after the bye, is the the scoring is not up that much. You know what I mean? Like, I really thought that that was part of the big plan, right? They were not scoring enough, and they weren't. They were sub-19 points or something ridiculous like that last year. So I understand you fire Scott Turner, that's fine. But they've been moving the ball this year. They just have not been putting up the kind of points that they need to. It's very frustrating. Yeah, it's definitely frustrating. And, and they, they've, for me, they've really lacked the explosive plays the last few weeks um, no to to hit things down the field. And obviously, like an explosive play that can get you a touchdown is obviously great. Um, but then it, just the threat of the, those those shots down the field to defenses, if, if they're thinking, okay, they're actually legit might hit something over their our heads. They can't then just buzz down on all the quick stuff underneath and, and make the quick stuff underneath really hard to do. Um, and obviously this offense is about doing that quick stuff underneath and getting the ball out quickly and, and spreading it around. And that's great. But when the defense isn't threatened deep, they can just buzz everyone down in the flats and underneath and then make that quick stuff really hard to do. And, and that's what we've seen the last few weeks. Um, with good defenses like the Cowboys and the Dolphins and stuff. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it is frustrating for sure. Um, it, it's not like they haven't called some deep shots as we saw in this one. They had that one to McLaurin that mm-hmm. was ne- very nearly a touchdown, but they just, the protection just broke down. And, and um, I, I think the long and the short of it is, is that it's, they're going to, they're going to need to, upgrade the offensive line going forward regardless of who their quarterback or, or play caller is going to be um and and that will enable them to to push the ball down the field more all right buddy um i enjoyed it and we'll see you again next tuesday cool thank you everybody for watching at home